Perhaps you're studying NMR spectroscopy, and no doubt you heard of terms such as shielding and deshielding. Now you might be wondering, what does that even mean? The terms shielding and deshielding has to do with the nucleus, the electrons, and the magnetic field. So the nucleus on the left side, if we're dealing with HNMR, is just a proton. This one is deshielded from an external magnetic field. And the reason why it's deshielded is because it has less electrons surrounding the nucleus. The one on the right is said to be shielded. Electrons with, which has charge are moving, and so they create their own tiny magnetic fields, which goes against the external applied magnetic field. And so the magnetic field that the nucleus actually feels is less if there's more electrons surrounding it. And so the electrons, they, they have a shielding effect on the nucleus. So the effective magnetic field that the nucleus feels is the difference between the applied magnetic field and the magnetic field generated by the electrons, which I write as B with a subscript E minus. And so that's what you need to understand about shielding. It's caused by the electrons surrounding the nucleus, and they protect the nucleus from the external magnetic field. Now let's see if we can summarize what we have just considered so far. As the number of electrons surrounding the nucleus increases, or if the nucleus is in a more electron-rich environment, the shielding effect will increase. And as that goes up, the effective magnetic field that the nucleus experiences will decrease. And this will decrease the resonant frequency or the frequency that's required to bring the nucleus to magnetic resonance. Now you might be wondering, why are these two proportional? And there's a formula that explains it. The operating frequency of a NMR spectrometer is equal to the gyromagnetic ratio, which is dependent on the nucleus, as if it's a hydrogen nucleus or a carbon nucleus, divided by 2 pi times the applied magnetic field. So the magnetic field and the frequency, they're proportional. If the magnetic field goes up, the operating frequency that's required to achieve nuclear magnetic resonance must go up as well. So thus, if the effective nuclear, I mean, if the effective magnetic field that the nucleus feels decreases, the frequency to achieve resonance will decrease as well. So what we want to do is combine these two statements. So if you have a nucleus in an electron-rich environment, it requires a lower frequency to achieve resonance. Thus, a nucleus that is shielded will appear on an NMR spectrum at a low frequency, as you can see from these two parts. And a nucleus that is deshielded from an external magnetic field will appear at a higher frequency on an NMR graph. So let's put that into practice. So let's say this is an NMR spectrum. On the y-axis, we have intensity. And on the x-axis, we have frequency. Now, the frequency doesn't increase as you go from left to right. It actually increases towards the left. So watch out for that one. So on the left side, this is high frequency, and on the right side, it represents a signal at low frequency. Now on the right side, it's set to be upfield. The left side is set to be downfield. So let's say if we have two signals. The first one corresponds to proton A, and the second one corresponds to proton B which proton is said to be shielded 
and which proton is said to be deshielded? Is it proton A or proton B? What would you say? Now, remember what we wrote down in our summary before. As the shielding effect increases, the frequency required to achieve resonance decreases. Proton B exists upfield at a low frequency. So we could say that proton B is shielded from an external magnetic field. Proton A exists downfield at a high frequency. So proton A is said to be deshielded from an external magnetic field. And so hopefully this gives you an idea of which protons are shielded and which ones are deshielded. So the ones that are shielded exist upfield to the right on the graph, and the ones that are deshielded exist downfield to the left of an NMR spectrum. Now let's apply this to a molecule. So let's say we have ethyl bromide, CH3CH2Br. Let's make this a red bromine atom. Now, there's two different types of protons, proton A and proton B. These three protons on this carbon are identical because they have the same electronic environment. These two protons are different. They're identical to each other, but they're different from these three protons. Now, which proton would you say is shielded and which one is deshielded? Which proton is in an electron-rich environment and which one is in an electron-poor environment? Now, what we need to do is consider the effect of Br on this molecule. So bromine is an electronegative atom which means that it's an atom that pulls electron density toward itself. Electronegativity is the ability of an atom to pull electrons to itself. And so we could say that proton B, basically the two hydrogen atoms on the CH2 molecule, those protons are in an electron poor environment because their electrons are being pulled by the bromine atom. Now, protons A, or the protons in the CH3 portion of the molecule, they are in a relatively electron-rich environment because they're further away from this electronegative atom. Thus, the protons corresponding to signal A are more shielded to an external magnetic field compared to the protons corresponding to signal B. Those protons are deshielded due to the electronegative atom that they're adjacent to. So if we were to draw a graph, we would have two signals. Because A is shielded, it's going to appear upfield. And because B is uh, deshielded, it's going to appear downfield on an NMR graph. Now, for the sake of practice, let's work on another example. So consider this molecule, CH3, CH2, attached to an oxygen atom with another CH2 group attached to a bromine atom. So what we're going to do is we're going to call uh, these protons. We're going to say it corresponds to signal A. This corresponds to signal B. And this one corresponds to signal C. Now let's say we have a graph with three signals. Which one would correspond to signal A? Which one will correspond to B? And which one will correspond to C? Now there's something called spin, spin, splitting and the n plus 1 rule. I'm not going to talk about that in this video. I'm just going to focus on the shielding and deshielding effect. In other videos, you may see like a, a splin pattern like this or something, which I'll discuss later. But for now, I want you to determine the location of each signal relative to each other. So which one is going to be upfield and which one's going to be downfield? Go ahead and take a minute to work on this example.
let's start with the protons that are most deshielded. So these are the ones that are closest to an electronegative atom. Both oxygen and bromine are electronegative. C is in an, an electron poor environment. It is the most deshielded because it's attached to two electronegative atoms. B is in the middle because it's only attached to one electronegative atom. The methyl group doesn't have any electronegative atoms attached to it. So therefore, it's in an electron rich environment, which means that it's shielded. So signal A is going to appear upfield because it's shielded. And signal C is going to appear downfield. Let me put down here because it's deshielded. It's, a, it's next to, um, it's adjacent to two electronegative atoms. B is going to be in the middle because it's just in the middle. This has two electronegative atoms, this has one, this has none. And so now you know how to identify the relative locations of each signal based on its proximity to an electron withdrawn group. And so remember, the protons that are deshielded are on the left, the ones that are shielded are on the right. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you like it.